Hello, dear friends. Today, in Alotra TV studio, we are pleased to welcome the esteemed Igor Mikhailovich Danilo. Greetings. Janna. Greetings. Elchin. Greetings. Igor Mikhailovich, the previous program, Sex and the Spiritual Path, certainly generated an extraordinary response among people, and they sent very many letters of gratitude, very many comments, and very many of their understandings and insights. People say that they received answers to questions that were worrying them for very, very many years, and that today they feel that a process of internal maturing is happening inside them, as they say it is happening right before their eyes. And today, on behalf of people, we would like to express gratitude to you, endless gratitude gratitude for the knowledge you revealed, for shedding light on the topics of the sacral role of a woman, of the Allah sisters, of the feminine power and its nature, and in general deep gratitude for the knowledge that really grants spiritual freedom because it is very much felt by people, and they note that there precisely happens this process of liberation from mindsets which the system has been imposing for many years. and. One of the first questions after the release of the program Sex and the Spiritual Path was the question that since the subject of the sacral role of a woman became clear, then what is the spiritual mission of a man? What is his sacral role in society? And indeed, precisely in this topic, there are many knowledge gaps that we would very much like to fill. And if we may… But it seems to me, not just gaps, but it is totally forgotten what a man is or who a man is, and who he should be. The topic of our today's program is the sacral role of a man in the life of society. Well, before we proceed directly to the topic of the sacral role of a man, we would still like to answer the questions that arose after the release of the program Sex and the Spiritual Path. Because in general, people understood and got imbued with the essence of what had been said. Nonetheless, questions have remained. Perhaps the first question is asked by a man. He asks, do I understand it correctly that during sexual intimacy every woman generates pure a lot? If we face the truth today, far from all women, are able to generate even sexual energy. Yet this is so. Mm -hmm. Why? Because everything is completely forgotten, and all the more, a lot. However, let's say, every woman is able to generate it, but it depends on men too. Not in the sense of a sexual game or anything else, but in the essence of the man himself. Well, as you have said, we will proceed to it later. That is, it directly depends on? On a man. Well, I'll put it simply. In the modern world, women are kind of additionally assigned the role of a cook. Does it make any sense for her to cook an abundant dinner with various dishes if there is no one who can eat it? A simple question. Igor Mikhailovich, well, here's another question from the same man. Why can a woman be cold, indifferent, and inactive when it comes to intimacy? For the same reason, because she has simply forgotten that she's a woman. After all, a man doesn't remind her about this. Let's just say, a single woman engages in the raw food diet, just likes it, not even vegetarianism. Well, will she cook, let's say, a stew, if there is no one to eat it, and she herself doesn't eat it either? Mm -hmm. It's clear. Here is another question from a woman. How to distinguish sex from magic? And how to do it without feeding the system during sex? Well, sex and magic are actually very closely intertwined. Why? Because just like magic, there is use of secret powers. They are always aimed, mostly aimed at some kind of power over someone, at winning someone's hand, someone's benevolence, or something else. Even if to get something by means of magic, then again, for something. But as a rule, everything ends with what? With sex. 
That is, the idea itself, not necessarily a fact of physical action, but aspiration and desire. This is what instigates people to do magic, meaning a person wants to look more attractive, more worthy, wants to be loved. However, it seems to me it's much more important for you yourself to learn to love than to want someone to love you by means of magic. And the distinction is very simple. It really is. There's nothing complicated here. In order not to feed the system during physical activity and after it, forget about your earthly desires. Don't seek to dominate someone, to play or manipulate. You should simply be honest in everything, even during physical engagement, in that very physical activity. Everything is simple. Igor Mikhailovich, there's also such a very old, ancient mindset from the system. It's condemnation of sex. What do people not see when they listen to their consciousness? Well, let's say, the consciousness of any person is always aimed at looking into someone's bed. However, no matter how much a person is striving to look into someone else's bed, he will see no one under another person's blanket except himself. It's true. And consciousness always works like this. Well, so as to criticize someone and to show something in a worse light than you are. Well, it is set up this way. And even more so, as far as sex matters are concerned, it is always, well, it is sort of, let's say, overly interesting for people, tempting, and at the same time, everyone says, ugh, this is so bad. Well, guys, if it were bad, would we be sitting here with you? And would anyone see us? Of course not, because we are the product precisely of this process, and this should also be remembered. But the system likes twisting and altering everything. Here's another letter that came from a woman, Igor Mikhailovich. The thing is that after the program, she took much interest in the history of female groups, and she found and sent to us some very interesting information, asking to comment on it, if possible. It is said that in ancient Sumer temple, women who were called Naditu, God's sisters, enjoyed a special status. In Mesopotamia, there was a cult of goddess Inanna, Akkadian Ishtar, the water-giving goddess. Inanna is mentioned as the supreme deity of Sumer. Temples of Inanna had at their disposal a lot of female acolytes. In ethnographic studies of the ancient city of Mari, we find that the jug of water which the goddess holds in her hands was connected to a spring, and during every holiday, it was probably a holiday of gathering water, water was flowing abundantly from the jug into which faithful people dipped their fingers. Life-giving water, that's what her cult was dedicated to first and foremost. And Actually, it turns out that the care for water was basically women's prerogative at that time. And we find a lot of goddesses who were water keepers or who were given water. In Egypt it was Hakat, and this name is also Precisely in Persia, she was called Anahit. In Greece, every water spring without exception was associated with the name of a female goddess. And why so many cultures, so many nations, and such a reverence for a woman with water? What did it mean? What kind of allegory is that? Well, this is very simple. This is exactly, as you've said, an allegorical reflection of the essence of a woman herself. After all, it wasn't only the matter of water. It's generally believed that water was not easy to access in the East, and it was valuable. But this cult wasn't only in the areas that lacked water. It's just that water actually gives life to a lot of things. Well, basically, to everything that is living in this world. Water is the source of life, just like the light is. Well, just as what a woman gives, that very a lot, is the source of life, but also of life eternal, while water gives temporary life. The power contained inside a woman can give not just temporary life, but the eternal one. And that's why goddesses were endowed with such a domain.
Thank you, Igor Mihailovich. I think that our viewers will be glad that they've got answers to their questions. Right, and here is another question. A woman also writes that during spiritual practices it happens so that when immersion is particularly deep, she is having an orgasm. And her question is, is it good or bad when such corporal reactions occur? Let's say, if this happens during meditative practices, it's not good. But if it is during spiritual practices, that's wonderful. And here, frustrating as it may be to the menfolk, men are not capable of this when doing spiritual practices. During meditative ones, they are. There is fantasy. There is thought. There is consciousness there. While in spiritual practices, consciousness doesn't control anything anymore. There are natural processes there. That's wonderful. Great. The main thing is that she should use this tool correctly, as a springboard. Another question, Igor Mihailovich, from a man. If a woman is a bearer of a lot, why in intimate relationships of married couples is there some heaviness associated with carrying out the matrimonial duty or even a refusal to do it? Well, this is exactly where the answer is hidden. Matrimonial duty. Well, who likes carrying out duties? And towards whom do spouses have this duty? Such spouses owe the system. They must feed it. And a person feels that this is, well, let's say… Slavery. Absolutely right. Well, when you don't feel like doing physical activity, but you are forced to, both of them don't feel like doing it. But that's the way it is established. The question is, established by whom? Well, that's what neighbors and friends say. That you should feed the system regardless of your reluctance. Duty to the system. Duty to the system. Though all of this can be transformed into a wonderful action, right? Here is another letter from a woman, but of a different kind. She is writing that she has been in marriage for six years already. Her relationship with her husband is very good, but sex takes place mainly in darkness and very quickly. She wants him to do his part and just go away. At that, she does have a need for sex, but consciousness locks it up, saying that this is sinful and incompatible with the spiritual path. Mm -hmm. And exactly after the program Sex and the Spiritual Path, she asked herself a question, yet what is wrong? How can I change myself? But she failed to answer it. And this case is not the only one, because this is… This is actually a very common case. Yes. Well, here upbringing and many other things, and religious aspects matter. And for some reason, many people believe that all this is shameful, this is indecent, this is inappropriate, this is a hindrance to the spiritual. Well, guys, everything that is natural is set by nature. And when a person is robbing and depriving oneself of anything, what's good in that? A simple question. Everything is simple, in fact. But it's extremely beneficial for the system to transform this action into its own tool of manipulating a person. And she awaits this intimacy with horror. She doesn't want it. Well, as she says, so that he would do his part and run away. He doesn't want it either. Yet again, it's a duty. Well, and what kind of life is that? Yet, on the other hand, there is sort of a physiological and psychological need. Well, there is a physiological and psychological need. But again, all this need comes from what? From that very consciousness. Well, it's simply consciousness playing tricks on them. Game of hormones. Mm -hmm. And instead of getting rid of this stumbling block and being free, right? There is one of two options here. Either celibacy or, guys, just be free from these mindsets and live in peace. It's sinful to use a lot powers for magic purposes. That's sinful. While well, all the rest, excuse me, but what is sinful in the fact that a person does sit-ups or push-ups off the floor in the morning? Or in what spouses, well, or friends, doesn't matter, do in their bedroom in the evening, right? What is sinful in that? Isn't it what all animals do? Or do animals hide in the dark caves, too? And, pardon me, do it quickly and run away. What is sinful in that? 
it's clear that there should be some culture, morals, and, well, decency. Well, there should be, since society is civilized. But when you do it on your own and voluntarily, then, pardon me, let's say one won't go far riding a hobbled horse. Life should be easy and nice in all respects. Life in freedom and in love, yes. And how can it be otherwise? Is it really life if this isn't so? People doom themselves to torments, then suffer and think why. And all because someone thinks and takes decisions for you. Maybe you should grow up and start doing that yourselves. The next question is also about love and hatred. A girl is writing, she thanks you for the program and asks the following question. There is one step from love to hatred. Why does it happen so, and what should one do in such cases? She's telling her story about how her love and intimate relationship first turned into jealousy and then into hatred towards the young man. And now she's dating another person, but she still cannot get rid of the feeling of hatred towards her ex-partner. Consciousness is trying to slander him in the eyes of other people in every way possible, and palms have thoughts on her about him even during sex with her new boyfriend. What should she do? It's a typical situation. But this, so to say, may be compared to quantum entanglement. Although, perhaps, let me explain this not on micro, but on macro objects. Well, let's say, there existed a certain planetary couple. And so, she was on his orbit or he was on hers, it doesn't matter. And then, due to certain circumstances, she moves to a remote orbit, no, to a remote one, but she doesn't leave completely. And she still continues interacting with him. And she cannot break away. And for this very reason, no matter who enters his orbit, she will do everything, since she has a very strong attraction to him do everything in order to lead them away from the orbit. That's why she will, so to say, fling mud at him and spread it, just to prevent them from entering the, that orbit. Well, this happens both to men and to women. It doesn't matter at all what the gender is. This often happens. And why are love and hatred so close? Well, as you know, if we look from a medical perspective on what love and hatred are, Let's assume on that very PET scanner, right? I mean, the emission tomograph. We will see excitation of almost the same group of neurons. Why does this happen? The same physical sensations are there, both during love and during hatred. Well, I mean this kind of hatred. Hatred can be different. And this is exactly during this kind of hatred. It's just that consciousness already perceives everything under a different sign. And if love was giving euphoria and pleasure, hatred is basically the same thing, though it's already perceived from a negative perspective. And so she hates him, or he hates her to such an extent, well, that they are unable to let one another go, right? That they are even unable to become aroused with their partner, who's much better in sexual terms, represents a better match, and is much more humane. Well, without the ex-partner, so to say, with the new one, she can neither become aroused nor reach the peak. Mm -hmm. An absolute attachment. If, let's put it simply, this doesn't concern you, then it cannot trouble you either. But if your consciousness is clinging to this, ponder over it, right? Absolutely right. Why does this disturb you? And, as we've already said, love and hatred is one and the same thing. Dependency, yes. Absolutely right. There are so many people who understand all this and live not to the dictation of consciousness. And when they understand this attachment, even if they have broken up, they have new partners, they often meet and talk to each other, they remain in this quantum entanglement. However, sex isn't actually the main thing in the life of people who feel attraction to each other. After all, simple communication is sufficient, and they are satisfied. They don't part and don't separate. They don't get jealous, they don't start wars, and don't gather coalitions of male or female friends around them in order to tell what a scoundrel she is, and why she's so bad, and all those mean things and dirt. 
After all, this always occurs due to excessive intelligence. Right. As dictated by consciousness. In fact, there are good people as well. There are various examples. Right. There are also following questions. A young man writes that consciousness is telling him, I have the knowledge, I perform meditations, but years go by and nothing happens to me. Well, he can perform these meditations his entire life and nothing will happen to him. Another pair of arms won't grow from his body. His limbs, so to say, won't get longer. Yet, what does he expect while performing meditations? And again, there's a question. In order for something to happen, one should not just light candles, but should love God and strive for Him. Whereas, lighting candles is good, it won't hurt, there will be more light in the Church, but this won't bring a person closer to God. Isn't that so? Meditation and spiritual practice are different things. Right, it turns out there is an expectation. He expects a miracle. He expects magic. He expects that something will change for him in three-dimensionality. While consciousness will just never perceive any changes in a person in spiritual terms, it will always oppress him and tell him that he hasn't achieved anything and hasn't got anything and that nothing will ever happen. And so people, due to excess of intelligence, who live by consciousness, well, they are such, they always consider themselves intellectually developed, higher than everyone. Well, simply put, banal egoism, pridefulness locks them. It locks them to such an extent that, well, people simply lose their way and become trite slaves of the system. Isn't it so? It is. Such a man in a case. Surely. Whereas, when a person really develops love in himself, he becomes different. While if a person waits for someone to fall in love with him, the objects of his attraction, as we've just discussed, simply because he performs meditations or lights candles near icons. Well, all this is akin to magic. Yes. Isn't it so? While any deal with the devil is doomed to something bad. This is really so. There is also such a question, but you've already answered it many times, although, to all appearances, the person either hasn't watched the programs where you were answering it, or he missed it somehow, or he has encountered the knowledge only recently. The question is as follows. Isn't meditation a self-suggestion? Maybe it's just hypnosis. After all, I can also simply imagine that I supposedly feel something, having convinced myself of that. Yet, yeah, meditation is precisely Imagining. It's exactly that very technique of auto-hypnosis. It's just meditation. Guys, well, let's simply start. Let's explain what is autogenic training. Just banal… Relaxation. Relaxation and imagining. This is the work of consciousness with our body. But what do we notice? With the right approach, when done correctly indeed, we notice when a person gives an order to his hand to become lighter, he is lying in a completely relaxed state, his arm is on the scales, and we can observe variation of indication in the scales. When he gives an order to make it heavier, we observe changes in the scales, that it becomes heavier. But the person doesn't strain a single muscle, and sensors that are attached to the arm and respond to muscle tension, again, show that not a single muscle has been strained. Then a person gives an order and imagines that his arm has become warmer. What does a thermometer show? that his arm is getting warmer. He gives an order to make it colder, and it becomes colder. In other words, there's an obvious physical manifestation of the mind's order. Isn't it so? When a person is performing a meditation, he imagines that through certain channels there flows energy. No matter of which kind, yes, there is excitation. And yet again, if we place sensors that measure the nerve impulse, we will see excitation along its way. Isn't that so? Given proper performing, absolutely so. Another thing is, when a person imagines that energy is flowing, not through his channels, 
when the sensors will not show anything, but he can imagine and feel it indeed. That's, guys, what auto-hypnosis is. It is learning, first of all, by means of that very secondary consciousness. Well, or just consciousness to work with one's body. This is autogenic training. However, to free oneself from the power of secondary consciousness by means of primary consciousness, that's what meditation is. Meaning, there is concentration, calming of thought, when the swarm of bees in the head can no longer buzz all the time. Isn't that so? That's what it is needed for, in order to reach a more peaceful state, in order to remove the imposed emotions, that is, the freedom of primary consciousness from the secondary one. But spiritual practice, guys, is something completely different. It's impossible to instill anything, it's impossible to induce anything by any actions. At the level of consciousness, physical body, or anything else, those manifestations which occur in spiritual practice, consciousness is not even able to perceive them. Afterwards, there is some evaluative image, and consciousness only perceives, well, let's say, traces of spiritual practice, and it tries to evaluate and to comprehend them somehow. But again, these are just allegories from consciousness of the truth that is happening inside. However, consciousness always denies the spiritual. This should also be known and understood. Well, if a person is not ready, if he's lazy, if he's arrogant and selfish, he will never be able to know spiritual practice. Well, meditation, easily. It's not difficult, is it? Therefore, this person is right. Meditative practices are auto-hypnosis, but it can be used with great benefit for oneself. At least, make yourself learn what you couldn't. That is, by means of that very meditation, you can develop your own intelligence. This is useful too. Igor Mikhailovich, well, now going back again to the program Sex and the Spiritual Path, this program really gave a rise to a huge wave of insights and revelations, and it can be clearly seen both in the responses of people and in their discussions, including those in social media. A very interesting letter came to us in which a person shared a modern parable about an obese pastry chef, and we have decided to read it aloud today. I want to apologize in advance for the words that I will voice because the parable contains some household slang, so to say. But the most important thing is that it reflects the true essence of the egoism of Godfighters. Therefore, I shall read it. In one facility with the world-famous school of yoga, there was also a small pastry shop. Its host was a very obese pastry chef who considered himself an unsurpassed master of confection business. Sometimes in the mornings and in the evenings, when the pastry chef came to work and was leaving after it, in the facility he came across the yogis and even the guru of the school himself. He started conversations with them about the essence of yoga, asked about its importance for a person, but at the same time, he certainly emphasized the greatness of his work and the importance of spectacular confectionery in the world of gastronomy. He was saying that sweets, akin to honey, are a source of gustatory pleasure and positive emotions for most of their consumers. While the Guru was telling him that yoga allows one to find inner peace, by assuming specific asanas and concentrating on one point, for example on the tip of his nose, a yogi can pacify a swarm of thoughts in his head, which is like a swarm of bees that keep buzzing and stinging painfully. And having left only one of the bees, he is able to control its flight. At that, it becomes absolutely controllable and harmless. Once, inspired by his story, the obese pastry chef asked to join his classes, and naturally the guru invited him over. But when the pastry chef came to classes, he failed to assume even in a single easiest asana, while other students of the guru seemed to effortlessly tie their bodies nearly into knots. This really enraged the pastry chef, for he believed that everything was within his power and he could do anything. Noticing his disappointment, the guru came up and explained to him that in order to master yoga, he first needed to lose at least a half of his weight, and for that he should stop eating sweets. 
Well, and if he wanted to eat, it was better to have a carrot for a snack and drink some water. For two days, the obese pastry chef was eating carrots, washing them down with water, and found that his beautiful pastry creations, which hadn't been sold, began to spoil. For usually, at the end of the day, he ate them himself. So a question arose before him. What should he do? Give them away to poor hungry children? Well, in this case, people would quickly get the idea and stop buying from him, and after the store gets closed in the evening, they would be sending their children to get free cakes. Perhaps he should dump them, yet if people saw his masterpieces in the garbage, they would think, what kind of masterpieces are those if they are lying in the garbage? And they would stop buying too. And then it dawned upon him. Everything is logical. After all, he has been working here and has been friends with yogis for about 10 years already, but they have never bought his cakes. And if there were offices here, then his cakes would be in great demand. And this guru friend is no friend at all. He's a deceiver. Indeed, he deceives people, forcing them to tie their bodies into knots and sniff their own butts and eat carrots at that. And the obese pastry chef made a decision to help the poor, confused people. Now, when parents brought their children to yoga classes, he boldly approached them and told his story. I've been here for 10 years with these yogis, and I know everything about them since I've gone through this. Their guru is a pervert. He forces people to twist their bodies almost into knots and smell their butts at that. And he promises them that they will be able to focus on the tips of their noses. But I've been able to do this since childhood. After all, it's enough just to squint one's eyes and the nose tip is visible. Moreover, this guru is absolutely literate. He doesn't even know a recipe of the custard. And he goes against God himself. After all, if God wanted people to be twisted and smell their butts, we would be born distorted freaks, and our butts would be under our noses instead of mouths. So save your children until it's too late. Better buy a piece of sweet cake for them. It is magnificent and will make your children truly happy. And generally speaking, for as long as they are little, buy cakes for them as often as possible while they can eat them. Whereas when they become too stout and fall ill with diabetes, they won't be allowed to eat cakes anymore, since such diseases are inevitable companions of happy people. Having heard this story from the parents, the Guru only smiled and said, Happy is not even the one who will remove the beast sting out of himself, but the one who lives without bees in his head, having plunged into the source of boundless happiness and joy. That's the parable. Dear friends, regarding bees, it's a fortuity. After all, just before this, I said about the swarm. Igor Mikhailovich, yes. About bees, and then you are reading this to us. It's a very interesting parable, precisely. Nothing new. Everything's commonplace, thanks to the one who has sent it. It was funny. It made us laugh. It's just that we wanted... We wanted to say how the system distorts everything, what relates to the spiritual path. Well, this is always so. This is normal, because it's the system. Right, it simply devastates. Right. Yet, what does the system see? Again, regarding these groups and this yogi. Yes. That's what it sees, when it's not pleasing for it. Right, it's just that it makes a controlled hand puppet of people. And the person is cheerful when among people, but having remained one-on-one -on -one in the darkness. Well, yes, here he experiences something totally different. Right. Yes. This is life. He's in a mood for laughter. Let's say, it is these merry fellows in public and loners in the soul who are indeed the main liars, just because they lie to themselves in the first place. They evoke pity, but it is possible to help only the one who extends his hand. Well, if this hand is being rejected when you are extending it to him, how can you help him? In no way. It's the choice of people, freedom, the freedom granted by God. A person is entitled to choose life or death. That's his right. Yet, pridefulness lies in the basis here. Of course. What else? Selfishness, laziness, and pridefulness. After all, as it is nicely said in the parable, 
The system substitutes things. It says that… Absolutely. It substitutes everything. You are right. You are unique. What will it tell to a Godfighter, first of all? That he's a unique creation. But he's exceptionality. You know, just like grandmothers say to their little grandchildren, they are actually the cleverest and the best ones for them. But having grown up, instead of their grandmother, they listen to their consciousness. It's the one that overtakes this role and talks. And it's really pleasant to listen about yourself, that you are good, that you can do everything, and so on. As for exploring some religions, some spiritual paths, why do you need those? After all, what's the main thing? The main thing is intellect, isn't it? While other things are totally unnecessary. And you know, regarding these intellectually well-developed people who deny both God and everything spiritual, here is a vivid example. Literally recently, one person, I won't mention his name, well, a globally famous, very clever, intellectually developed person has passed away. He was building theories in his head in every way possible. Well, sort of parallel universes and the like. And he always denied God. He took offense at the wrong one. He was offended that God gave him such a fate. Well, it wasn't God who gave it to him. God was giving him a chance which he didn't use. Well, nevertheless, he believed that God made him like that, gave him such a fate, and he denied. However, when the time came to die, he was asking for a priest so violently that basically when the priest came, he didn't let him go until his last breath. He was hoping to jump into the last carriage of the departing train at the last moment. That's what their essence is. When it seems to a person that whole life is ahead, nothing seems to threaten him. Consciousness tells him that everything is fine. What God? Live, rejoice, and enjoy life. Life is wonderful. You are actually, especially if a person is young, you are young, intellectually developed, and so on. Even if a person is not quite young, consciousness tells him, well, where is that death? And what is death in fact? Death is when you simply fall asleep. You fall asleep in the evening and wake up in the morning. No big deal. You don't remember that, do you? It's the same with death. It is frightful only due to waiting. But when you fall asleep, there is nothing frightful anymore. Well, the trouble is that after death, a person doesn't sleep. It is here that sleep is sort of a natural, necessary function for the body, when personality is resting from consciousness. While there, there is no sleep. Well, never mind. Igor Mihailovich, you know, since in the previous program we raised the topic of female power groups and their sacral positive role for the life of humanity, viewers became exactly interested in the topic of male power groups in the negative context. And they sent a lot of information with historical references and with a request to comment on this very information. While there is plenty of information, maybe voice briefly at least some of it, okay? Okay, go ahead. The most interesting thing is that people have got exactly to the root sources where everything started. And everything started precisely from the transition from matriarchy to patriarchy. And they have discovered that indeed, during this period, male unions began to form, secret unions at that. And these unions, their activities were aimed at restricting precisely the rights of women and that they… Not only. Mm -hmm. These unions began to form. Well, let's call things by their proper names. There were female groups that, yes, had sex. However, sex was not their essence. It was a tool to achieve much more. In the last program, we talked about this. Yes. They didn't do magic. They procured what was priceless, accumulated it, and passed on to those who needed it. They bestowed life upon the alive ones, so to say. But what's mere opposite is establishment of male groups who also had sex with each other. They also performed certain practices, only completely different ones. And they had a lot of ritual stuff. It all came down to magic combinations. 
when a group of men reaches, well, let's say, certain peaks, and they use it to gain force, the force that grants power. First of all, the power of the Word. Back then, it originated, and to this day, it exists. And these groups used to be, and they unfortunately still exist. And indeed, this is working magic. Well, if we look at what kind of force it gave, then in history, yes. starting, excuse me, from Alexander of Macedonia to Hitler and many more, there are not enough fingers to tell exactly what they received. But let's look further. What did they pay for it? Yes. For their illusory power. After all, their power was very short-lasting, and they will be paying for it for a very long time and they will never pay off the lives that they took, pay for those murdered angels who were not able to spread their wings. Isn't this right? It's just amazing how the system, now you said about Alexander of Macedonia and about Hitler, and the guys have also found information that in the very ancient Greece… And their teachers, right? Right. Aristotle, Plato, and many others, those whom we know in history. Caesar, that very great orator. Oh, the greatest orator of all times and nations. Where did he get this gift from? And what's the use of this gift to him now? A simple question. If only people knew that, they wouldn't engage in this nonsense. The devil will always deceive. After all, any contract with the devil is single-vectored, and this should be known. Igor Mikhailovich, you have also said that there were certain rituals in male groups. Certainly. And the following question also arises, does ordinary sodomy give this power, or… Of course, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. It's the same as, pardon me, what is it called, when a woman is with a woman, mm -hmm. lesbianism. Does it give the power of a lot? It doesn't. Well, it doesn't. But if it gives people pleasure, let them do it. What's wrong with that? That is, other tools are definitely needed. Someone, excuse me, likes carrots, someone likes cakes, and someone likes carrot cakes, no problem. There you go. It's just that it is also interesting that it turns out that all these initiations in those very secret groups, and we know that in Sparta there were military Surely. sexual initiations of, of course. exactly teenagers. And they were considered to be a very powerful process that gave a warrior his bellicosity. But their bellicosity was aimed at animality, meaning an animal was awakened in a person. Well. That's what was valued in warriors. It's just that what people don't see, right? Why, after all? People don't see a lot. In reality, consciousness tells us that we see everything and that we know everything, that we are very smart. No, guys. Everything that is the most interesting is hidden. If we look at that side, at that which lives in the shadows, so to speak, there is a huge ocean of life there. It is much bigger than here. And all this is hidden from our eyes. We exist only in the third dimension. Even for your intellect, so as not to offend it, this should be clear. It is trite three-dimensionality. However, your intellect will not perceive the fourth dimension already, not to mention the fifth and the sixth, where it's even more interesting. After all, each of them has its own ocean. And everywhere, there are those who want to eat. And no, that which is soul-filled, not just spiritualized, they are all spiritualized, for they are living. While a soul-filled human exists in the third dimension, and then he continues his existence from the seventh dimension up to complete freedom. But in spiritual practices, he is able to go through all 72 dimensions to complete freedom. Up to the exit, beyond these dimensions. After all, life, let's say, is generated here, in three-dimensionality. Events are generated in the sixth dimension. All this is a soup of this material world. However, human life, of those who gain it, continues beyond the 72nd dimension, where there is nothing. 
and there is no one who measures where what's alive and eternal is. Well, this entire space, time and combinations, all this is here, in this sphere. Also, Igor Mikhailovich, going back to the topic in order to dot all the I's, there's probably the last question from people. As for this art of oratory, why do people, crowds of people, listen to these dictators, chiefs and orators, and not just they listen to them, but also act accordingly? Okay, I'll disclose this. It's already from the category of secret knowledge. I cannot and won't tell about this super-secret knowledge of theirs. What is done, how, and for what purposes, so that people wouldn't repeat the same mistakes. This is, after all, it's a great temptation for consciousness of many people. Yet, why did that very Caesar gain such a gift? Why did Hitler gain such a gift? It's a matter of power, the power of influence. Well, everything is simple. In the world of shadows, there is a very rigid hierarchy. And in order to suppress little demons in your heads, a strong demon is needed. So the point of this male, well, group, let's put it in a civilized manner, was to grow the strongest demon in the thirteenth one. And he suppressed the rest. And for him, it didn't matter whether there were 10, 100, or 1,000 people. He influenced everyone who heard him. Well... Right. Well, generally speaking, there is plenty of information on the topic indeed. However, also regarding the military aristocracy who at their symposia, or as it is said nowadays, at certain well, symposiums yes. in ancient Greece basically engaged in. I wonder if many people know what a symposium is. Mm -hmm. In the true meaning. And as you've correctly said, that very Plato who was praising the feast of sodomy in his works, telling how… Well, that's exactly the reason why he became Plato. Yes. After all, at that time there were much smarter people, and they could look much deeper, but history didn't remember them, because they were dropped out of his Torahry. Well, he remained. Hence, someone needed that. Mm -hmm. Igor Mikhailovich, moreover, we have now discussed this topic of secret groups, and an understanding has indeed formed of how the system has been ruling these people in history from millennium to millennium by absolutely the same directives, thirst for power, egoism, and pridefulness. And once you told us a very interesting piece of information about the influence of invisible forces, the third forces, and I believe it would be desirable to tell in such a context about what people don't see, because this is the knowledge which helps a person today to understand how his consciousness works, where these events are actually generated, that these events are generated in the invisible world, and who is the instigator of these events. Maybe also reveal the topic of third forces, at least briefly. Well, to understand what third forces are, there is a human personality. It's that little callow angel. And there is consciousness. Consciousness of a human is a part of the system. It always tries to impose on personality that the latter is consciousness. However, consciousness also has a tool of pridefulness. Well, or as they said in ancient times, consciousness is that very… Well, in the past there was such an expression, a madoc, right? Consciousness is that very madoc, with which we dig graves for ourselves. Well, nowadays it's a shovel, so to say. Whereas third forces are exactly those who intervene between consciousness and personality. There are lots of them. I've already talked about that. But all of them want to eat. And here one should understand that neither consciousness nor these third forces, while there is a sea of them, have anything sacred or anything human. They only have an appetite. It's like, you know, crazy businessmen who can never have enough no matter how much they earn, because competitions begin among them. And the fewer of them remain in this Forbes magazine, 
That is its title, I believe. The broader their appetites are to become. At least the third one. The second one, yes. Or even better, the first one. It's the same for the system. It gorges endlessly. This is in brief, just for understanding. But I'd like to say more. All these influences, all these forces, whatever they are, cease to have power over personality that lives by the spiritual world. then all these evil spirits are powerless. Exactly to the topic of men and women, there are other questions from people. A person writes and complains that, based on his life experience, women, on the contrary, humble men in every way possible. He writes that, for as long as a man makes concessions and plays up to a woman, everything's relatively fine in their relationship, but only until he starts talking openly, and then the relationship worsens. Why does it happen this way? May I tell an anecdote? Well, I'll be brief and polite. Two alcohol abusers meet. Well, and one of the men tells the other, he says, you know, he says, now I'm going to get drunk, come home, and my wife will scold me again. There goes trouble again. The other man says, just act as I do. The first man says, and how do you act? Well, he says, when I come home and my wife starts scolding me, I just tell her to get lost, and I go to bed. They meet the next day, and so the first man is totally beaten, with bruises all over. The other man says, what happened? Well, he says, what happened? I followed your advice. I came home, and my wife started scolding me, so I just told her to get lost. Well, see how she prettified me with a frying pan? The other man says, wait, did you say that out loud? <laughs> That's how it is, both in that case and in this case. This happens and will happen for as long as demons, pardon me, predominate in people's heads. After all, both men have forgotten that they are men and women have forgotten that they are women. They have totally forgotten about their mission and live by earthly values to the dictation of the devil in their heads. Yet, what will he primarily dictate? In order to understand this, one should understand what a human being is here for. Just try to answer the question to yourselves. What is the goal of your life? As simple as that. And here the most interesting thing begins. If your goal is a short-term one, then believe me, this is terrible. Why? It is illusory. It's the same as to live in an illusion. Having achieved it, you will gain emptiness. If your goal is difficult to achieve, but it's achievable, it's better than a rapidly achievable goal. But you'll be disappointed when you achieve it. If your goal is unachievable, this is grievous, isn't it? But if you don't have a goal at all, this is disastrous. Why? Because it's the same as a bucket without a bottom. It's a meaningless existence as of an empty piece of metal. What's the point of your life if you don't have a goal? Just think of this. However, if your goal is to gain something greater, to gain life, and it doesn't end with three-dimensionality, but goes beyond its limits, then your life has a meaning. In all other cases, what's the use of it if all this is meaningless for you. After all, any values that we determine for ourselves, so to say, and, indeed, we determine values ourselves, any material values of today turn into nothing tomorrow. What we endow with value gets depreciated. What is significant for us ceases to be such. And when we leave this world, it's not for us anyway. So what's the point? To leave someone or to leave something for someone? Yes, this is wonderful, this is splendid, you have fulfilled your duty. However, it's just a duty. And what is next? And what have you yourself gained? Igor Mihailovich, our friends have also addressed us, who forwarded a letter from their friend and asked us to read it out to you during the program. 
That is why, if you allow us, we would like to read it aloud. Go ahead, please. Mm-hmm. Greetings, Sigur Mihalovich. You and I are colleagues. I'm also a doctor. I'm keen on studying ancient civilizations and not only. I've probably already visited all places possible, including Mount Kailash, which you mentioned in one of the programs. I managed to visit it more than once. Sometime in the past, my friends and I did a lot of good for Tibet, so in the late 1990s we were invited to the historical capital of Tibet, the city of Lhasa, and we were even given the honor of meeting monks who practiced meditations in the cave monastery Drakirpa. When their elder found out that we were looking for Shambhala and had already gone to search for it several times following Rurik's footsteps, he left. He said that we didn't need to search for Shambhala because the spirit of Shambhala himself, Rikta and Chappa, was already incarnated in this world. That soon the time would come when the world would know about him. However, this would signify the end of times. To subsequent questions, he just answered that we needed to practice meditations as much as possible. When we attempted to question other monks, They told us a lot of legends, but nothing specific. However, my friends are sure that continuation of this story is directly related to you. I've had the time to watch just several programs with your participation and to briefly familiarize myself with the history of Alatra International Public Movement. It impresses, and more than a lot. In the program Sex and the Spiritual Path, you told about the female groups of the Alat sisters and about Sophia's group of the Templars. My friends assure that Alatra already has such a group. They ground their opinion on the fact that they really feel a spiritual support, especially in the last year. As for me, to be honest, while well, Watching your programs, I experience a dissonance. I see a man and hear a male voice that is saying absolutely right things. But once I close my eyes and switch off perception from the sound, and I feel myself a baby in the mother's arms, although it's my subjective perception, my friends assert that this Alatra's group of women, in addition to providing spiritual help to people, also performs the main function which consists in restraining the apocalypse and that this purpose has a global planetary scale. In their opinion, the heavenly birds are restraining the intensification of climatic, seismic and other negative factors all over the planet, and if it were not for them, everything would be increasing much faster and people wouldn't have a chance for salvation at all. So. My proposal is the following. I'm sure that many people will agree with me. If there is indeed such a group of the heavenly birds, then in order to overcome doubts in people's consciousness and in mine as well, once and for all, I suggest that you stop the work of this group at least for a month. For example, from the 1st of April until the 1st of May. And if during this period climatic, seismic and volcanic changes increase drastically, This will be very revealing and, moreover, beyond any doubt evidential. Certainly, an ideal option would be activation of the Yellowstone supervolcano. Let even a half of entire humanity die, but the other half would then kneel before you and would implicitly fulfill everything that you say. Better let a half of humanity survive than everyone die. Well, or at least may there be an earthquake, or may a super tsunami destroy one of the megapolises. Please understand, in order to save the majority, the minority might as well be sacrificed. This cannot be ruled out, otherwise doubts in people's consciousness will prevent them from changing. Of course, I do understand your peace-loving attitude and that you call people for love, but I think fear… Yes, precisely fear is the shortest way to people's hearts. It's a tempting proposal, very tempting, for consciousness of many people, not just for his. Consciousness always demands some proofs and miracles, and it is capable of sacrificing even the entire humanity, other people, but not itself, in order to get some confirmation for itself. After all, if I follow you, I'll waste life, I'll waste my years. Isn't that so? And why should I follow you? Prove who you are, then I'll believe in you, then I'll follow you. And as he writes, I would kneel. It's a habit of kneeling before Satan. 
And let's recall certain facts, my friends. After all, facts are very, very stubborn things. Let's recall Mary's son. After all, how many miracles people saw, those who were near him? What kind of signs were given to them? Isn't that so? However, when those God-fighters poured out the cup of their anger on him, along with their ignorance and dishonor, when they were beating and humiliating him, were throwing stones at him, which one among those who saw with their own eyes how sick people were cured, how he raised the dead man, who saw him walking on the water, or saw the greatest sign when the heaven opened wide, and the Lord Himself said, This is My Son. Which of them stood between him and the God-fighters, and took the strikes of those stones on themselves, which of them? No one. And even those closest ones who were near him, they refused him, while the one who strove to be closer than everyone else refused him three times, didn't he? So, what's the point in all these miracles? What's the point in what this man is proposing? And isn't this the reason why the last prophet, the wisest of the wise, said good, proper and very wise words? There won't be any miracles. There won't be any signs. For the greatest miracle is that truth which Allah has given you. The one who doesn't take this truth, who doesn't accept it, will die. The one who accepts it will gain life eternal. And the one who's faithful to Allah will be next to me. Whereas the one who stands against it, well, against those, there is Safaqar. Of course, some people tried to blame him for excessive bellicosity. Yet, who are these people? Liars and hypocrites. After all, following the story of Isa, didn't he have the right? Or didn't the Prophet get the right as a true man? having taken a sword into his firm hand to stand between the truth and a God-fighter. Isn't it so? And that is the point. Igor Mihalovich, there is such a question. How did it happen that the system picked up men on the hook of power? and turned them into its slaves. What do men need the power for? Well, it turned not only men into its slaves, but also women. As for power, well, as a matter of fact, it isn't needed for anything. These are all games of the system itself. After all, people play their lives. They play life. They play religion. They play faith. People in general play everything because the system plays them. A person stops playing only when he gains life or when he truly embarks on the spiritual path. That's when he begins to live. 
Well, as it is, it's like animals. Indeed, what is the main thing for animals? Who the leader is? That's what they are fighting for. Males fight to become an alpha male. Females fight to become an alpha female and to seize for themselves, let's say, a bit fatter piece, and that's all, for this minute. After all, animals don't think about tomorrow. They don't have it. Just like those who have submitted to Satan, they have no tomorrow. Just like a wild dog. That's how it... And how did this happen? Well, it happened that people have forgotten who they really are. And the system has taken power. In the previous program, we told how this had happened. Why repeat it? Meaning, the system sets men against men. Of course. And even men against women. The most awful thing is that the system sets people against each other. Indeed, in reality, there is one enemy, Satan. There are no other enemies for people, while all people are brothers and sisters to one another. However, the devil makes it so that we become enemies to each other. But at the same time, we don't even know that we have him in ourselves. I emphasize, he is within every one of us. As an integral part of our being, well, we have talked about this a lot. Yes, there is another point that from ancient times the system has been imposing fear towards women and instilling in people's minds that a woman is a source of temptation. What are such mindsets for? So that women's essence would be lost. After all, a woman is a source of temptation, not so much sexual or something else, but rather to enslave her essence. After all, the system extremely dislikes everything related to the Divine. While a woman is endowed with special value, when she's a woman, she is the source of life, not only of temporary, but also of eternal one. And to enslave this and to rule over this is the same as for a demon to rule over an angel. Far too tempting for the system. Therefore, the system has done everything, to bring a woman into a state of such oppression, to dehumanize her to such an extent, and to turn her into a slave. A slave to whom? A slave to a man. You can imagine how much all this is twisted and altered, how distorted the whole essence is. And we are living in this mess. And it is us who supported it, first of all, in our heads. Igor Mikhailovich, of course, the questions are also very different, and there were very many questions about true celibacy. In the previous program, you've told that celibacy means getting rid of images first and foremost. Of Satan's power, mm -hmm. in the first place. Right. But at the same time, you know, in modern society, Celibacy is basically one of the tools by which the system manipulates. Therefore, it would be great to find out what the real practice of celibacy is and what difficulties are faced by… Well, let's ask the person who practices it, mm -hmm. if he doesn't mind. Of course not. Well, in actual fact, celibacy is not a must for all people, after all. It is, well, necessary for people who, say, want to get rid of the influence of that tool which the system uses to keep a person in slavery. I have adopted this practice for myself because I don't want to be a puppet in the system's hands. I'm a Muslim, and that's why this practice let's say, gives me freedom from that. Well, I'll give you such an example. It is as if some clever dude has been deceiving me all my life by slipping the same candy under various wrappers. Imbuing value into the empty. Yes, and it turns out that everything 
Well, the most valuable resources, attention, time, were wasted just in order to unfold this candy, to taste it, and to understand that all this was actually empty. And thanks to the knowledge, an understanding has come that, well, in fact, I don't need this candy to be a human being, to live a full life, and say, to fulfill my true mission in this life. And therefore, I'll put it this way, this practice gives freedom. Freedom, first of all, in the head. Because, well, as it was said in the previous program, there is an important point that all this must not happen in one's head, while everything starts, as they say, in the head. And this freedom leads to the fact that a lot of moments are felt in subtler detail, and the processes somehow pass more deeply, meaning, well… Let's say you've got an obvious benefit from this. Yes, that's right. After all, what does the system do? It imposes precisely these images in the head to such an extent, imbuing values, into what shouldn't actually be of any value for a person. Since we are talking about Muslims, again, I'll give a simple example. One of the people who has watched a program with your participation, well, and mine too, being a Muslim, said that the girls in the studio were too beautiful. And he couldn't listen to the program, as his gaze was distracted by, let's say, your charms. And I have a question, what kind of Muslim are you, if you are controlled by demons? How can you, with demons in your head, being controlled and manipulated by Iblis, step over the doorstep of a mosque? And if you don't step over the doorstep of the mosque, if you don't perform namaz, and what kind of namaz can you perform if you are controlled by Satan? Tell me, my friend, what kind of… Is this a game and are you lying to Allah? So what kind of Muslim are you then? After all, what has been said? If people follow the truth, which the Prophet himself brought here by the will of Allah, then love and respect will be throughout the world. And society should be like this. Yet, when demons and genies reign supreme in people's heads, then we have what we have now. Then the one who calls himself a Muslim doesn't hear the truth. Or am I wrong? Absolutely right. If a person gets seduced, then he's a slave. Absolutely right. And Islam… He's a slave of his temptations. Yes. And what does Islam say, first of all? Islam is first and foremost inner purity. Absolutely right. And it tells that it's impossible to seduce a person. Why? Because except love for Allah, except service to Allah, nothing exists for him. That's the essence of celibacy. That's right. That's when he's a Muslim. Yes. That's when he has a right to raise his head to Allah and say, I love you. Isn't it so? And what will he hear in response then? He'll feel love too. The same. Absolutely right. But when demons control him, and he, like a beggar, is standing and asking, Oh, Allah, send me this, send me that, that's when demons are manipulating him. Does Allah hear him at that time? Of course not. Surely not, because he doesn't exist for Allah. That's why this person is one of those who stands against the truth. Igor Mihailovich, it turns out that in every religion, the earthly and the spiritual path of prophets is a certain standard and ideal for imitation for every man. And it is also interesting that we have found information in Zoroastrianism regarding Zarathustra, regarding the qualities he possessed. I would like to read it out that, 
At his side, all the devas rushed away, copulating obviously. At his side, they drew back their ways from the men and women who were wailing, tormented by devas. When Zaratush Raspitama was performing his prayer, with all the pauses subsequently louder and louder, all the devas were hiding beneath the earth, bereft of supplications, devoid of prayers. Of this sacral meaning. And here it is mentioned, and devoid of prayers, the devas were hiding beneath the earth. For many prayers of people are addressed exactly to them. Well, many prayers, not many, but all in which people are scrounging before God. Those who don't come to Him with love and gratitude, but come with a petition. Then these prayers are offered up to those devas, but not to God. Here we would also like to talk about this inner spiritual power. This power is an example for all men, for true men. This is what men have forgotten mm -hmm. about what the true mission of a man is, its essence. In society, there is some kind of traditional understanding of who a man actually is. There is an understanding that he is a defender of all the weak, that he is a brave and courageous person, that he is a determined, strong-willed, hard-working and responsible person. Somewhere it is said that he is a knight who protects his lady of the heart, However, considering how nowadays in the modern world the system imposes certain mindsets and certain ideals of what a human should be like, what a man should be like, there arises a question. Does every person perceive these qualities in his consciousness correctly? How are they portrayed in his consciousness? What is understood by the words nobility, power and courage? Because somehow, subconsciously, every man feels that of course, he is not what the system wants to present him, right? Meaning like, I don't know, James Bond who is fighting against some troops, against an army, and he is not some kind of bodybuilder who is measuring his strengths with a rival, and he is absolutely not a womanizer who seduces yet another woman. And there is such a paradox in society that, on the one hand, men position themselves as prudent, cold-blooded warriors. But on the other hand, this very love for something creative, love for the mother, for that which gives birth to life, is inherent in them. On the one hand, they, let's say, speak at their various meetings and assemblies as orator athletes. However, at the same time, when they get into a car, they surround themselves with icons. And the question arises, who is a man himself really afraid of? Whom does he fear and why? And what knowledge is lost? We'd like to talk about the sacral role of a man in society. It is very curious to observe how the system imposes certain ideals in society, and if we just conduct a test and enter in Google, let's say, a search query, VIP gifts for men, then we can clearly see the pattern of what the system wants this ideal for imitation, the highest goal for men to be like. It wants the best man to read only the best literature. Interestingly, this literature includes the art of war, a certain number of laws of power, leadership lessons, the history of great military leaders, Alexander of Macedonia, Caesar, Napoleon… The same ones. Still the same ones. Billionaire's stories. Basically, we already said, we mentioned, yes, in that very Atlantis video, what such literature and such fascination with the Iliad volumes had led to. It's interesting that the system imposes preferences on a man, which are also related to alcoholization of society, because it is being imposed and promoted that a man should be given alcohol and alcoholic products as gifts. So, it wants the entertainment industry to be developing. Gifts are mainly related to some extreme sports. Well, and surely the system hasn't forgotten that a man is, after all, a defender and a hunter. That is why there are some accessories for hunting there as well. Yet, what is originally embedded in these qualities, in these notions? What used to be understood by these qualities in ancient times? Who is a man as a defender? 
what is man's manliness and what is the true power of a man? The true power of a man is in truth and in faithfulness. What is a real man strong with? With his essence, his true man's essence. That's what he is strong with. The entire value of a man and the reason why he was created by God is, while being less prominent and less interesting for the system, but possessing the power which a woman gives him to stand in the way of all demons. That's the essence of a man. To be not that kind of a hero, glorified in the Iliads and the like, but to be a true, real warrior, a warrior of the spiritual world, who doesn't fight against his own kind and who's not exploited by the system as a tool for enslaving a woman and belittling her, but who's like a support, something for which a woman gives a lot here, brings a lot here. The one who, consuming it, attains a much greater power than all the demons combined. That's his role, and that's the essence. Yes, it has been known from time immemorial that a man is a defender, a warrior. Yes, but the understanding was lost. A defender from what? Who does a man fight all his life And with? what is actually the sacral and symbolic image of a true man's spirit? Yes, for example, Jesus, as the Son of God, prophets, they are a spiritual ideal for people, the ideal of what the person's spiritual commitment, his utmost devotion and service to God, his inner purity should be like. You are right when saying that these are unreachable ideals for people. But you also gave us an example, a symbolic image of the one who is the closest to an understanding of the true mission of a real man in modern society. For many people, this will be a surprise. It's the image of St. George the Victorious. Yes, my friends. It is he who is the true image of a real man today. Indeed, it is George the Victorious who is actually a true guard for many men if we look around the world. And this is a subconscious inclination and a little bit of a religious outlook. Mm -hmm. Well, again, judging by the fact that, as you've said nowadays, men surround themselves with various icons in their cars. Yes. George the Victorious is among the most popular ones. And the most interesting thing is that people surround themselves with his icons, but they don't know the essence at that. Yes, absolutely right. They do it subconsciously. We were just very interested to see what is written about George the Victorious in encyclopedias, what is known, what is known. because the information is really interesting. We would like… You know, even what is known about him and what can be found in literature is a collective image. George the Victorious, but very few people know even what is known about him. Let's voice it, because as a matter of fact, he's known not only in Europe, but in Western Asia and in Near East as well. He's simply called differently. He unites the whole world. Yes. Many peoples have their own prototype of George the Victorious, but it comes from ancient times. And the funniest thing is that, with the same symbols. I'd like to share this information which we have found. Yes, it's please. It's very interesting, and we will be grateful if we comment in the course of our conversation. Go ahead. But regarding George the Victorious in particular, he has many different names. In Christian countries, he is a defender from the forces of evil, first of all. He's the one riding a white horse, wearing a red cloak, and defeating a dragon with a spear. A dragon fighter, a serpent fighter. What's interesting is that 
He had been revered long before such religion as Christianity. In the Muslim world, among the Arabs, this character is known as Jirjus, defender, warrior. He is one of the major non-Quranic figures that enjoyed special veneration. According to the history of the prophets and kings by Al-Tabari, Jirjus was a disciple of one of Isa's, Jesus' apostles. As a matter of fact, in Palestine alone there are many, about 22 cult sites associated with George the Victorian. They include compounds of mosques, Qubat al-Sahra, the Dome of the Rock, and Al-Aqsa in Jerusalem. In the Near East, he is revered under the name of Al-Hadr, and many legends are dedicated to him. He is considered one of the four immortals along with Isa, Ilyas, and Idris. In Egypt, a similar image of god Horus is known who is killing a crocodile with a spear. We know the same image of George the Victorious who is striking the larynx of a serpent with a spear. Yet, very few people know that on ancient icons, even in Christianity, George the Victorious was depicted with a spear. And in the last versions, on the top of the spear we see a cross, but some time ago, there was a latra, and it can still be found in some versions. Igor Mihailovich, right now you have touched upon the subject of the most famous image of George the Victorious, who strikes a serpent with a spear. I would like also just to remind you, or to read this legend out, because it is also closely connected with liberation of women, because… Go ahead, please. Well, George the Victorious and liberation of women, these are such subjects that always go alongside, because in the legends of that very Caucasus, he frees, goes down to hell… Everywhere. Yes, Samzimori. According to the legend of George the Victorious, in a lake not far from one city, a huge serpent similar to a dragon settled. He devoured people and contaminated the air with its poisonous breath. All attempts to exterminate it ended in the death of people. The ruler of the city asked gods, and they allegedly advised him to sacrifice a young man or a girl to the serpent every day. When the turn came to his daughter, to the daughter of the ruler, she was taken to the bank of the lake, where she awaited her death with horror. But a rider on a white horse appeared. Having learned about the monster, the warrior, not listening to the girl's warnings, attacked the serpent that had come out of the lake. He pinned the monster's throat with a spear to the ground, and the horse began to trample it with its hooves. Then the warrior told the girl to throw her belt over the restrained serpent and to take it to the city. Watching the monster that she was leading like an obedient dog, townspeople froze in amazement. George explained to them that he had defeated the serpent by the power of Christ. Apparently, this miracle happened in Syria, and here there are a lot of symbols. Lots of. Many people have heard about Maria's belt, Sophia's belt. And in this case, she threw the belt over and restrained the beast. What is this about? It's about that which we discussed in the previous program. It's about the power, the true power of a woman, about her divine proximity, which she has forgotten. However, she forgot about it due to certain circumstances created by men. Unfortunately, at that, the task for men is to change everything back. And for women, the task is the same, to help men. You know, what's also interesting is that George the Victorious is precisely depicted very often next to a maiden, in particular to the Mother of God, to Oranta. It is Virgin Mary with her arms raised in the form of a lot. There is also interesting information that has been found regarding George the Victorious, this warrior of the Spirit. It turns out that Yaroslav the Wise, the Kievan prince, who was Agapit's friend, who was friends with Agapit, at his time was baptized with the name of George in honor of the heavenly patron George the Victorious. According to the Chronicle, in the 11th century, in the center of Kiev, in honor of his victory, Yaroslav the Wise built St. Sophia's Cathedral, unique at the time where Our Lady Oranta occupied the central place. In particular, you have mentioned Oranta, and everyone knows very well 
what Aranta is. It is symbolic Alatra. After all, when they started removing Alatra as a sign from everywhere by the system's will, and this is so, this is really so, my friends, then smart people who truly served God began to conceal it in symbols. Well, that's how that very Oranta emerged, a lot with its essence. By the way, in history it's exactly this way. The Alatra sign was well known in the territory of Slavic countries before the adoption of Christianity. Before the 17th century, numerous tops of St. Sophia's Cathedral were decorated with the signs of Alat, and the Alatra sign was located at the central place, which is confirmed by relevant documents that have been preserved. However, these tops were replaced with crosses, although the Oranta symbol has remained. It's just that it's also interesting that it turns out that Every time when people addressed George the Victorious, they primarily asked him for preservation of the light of the eyes. Precisely this word. And what is the light of the eyes? After all, spiritual vision was exactly spoken of, that inner gaze which reveals the true meaning of everything. That's what was talked about, which shows the essence of everything that exists. There is also this information, it's also interesting, in popular beliefs of Transcaucasia regarding the fact that during a thunderstorm George the Victorious races on a white horse and kills evil spirits with a forked arrow. What kind of meaning is this? What kind of a forked arrow is it? Well, forked swords, forked arrows and spears with a moon-shaped head. It was considered that this gave a special power, a divine power. Well, in actual fact, this is just symbolism, reflecting the Alat symbol. Just that. However, this way, again, magic was arising. To take a symbol of the divine and to bring it, pardon me, into a trite, earthly, murder. But when it's like George the Victorious fighting evil spirits, this is a correct understanding. Yet, when people fight against each other, this isn't right. And you know, everywhere, one way or another, what unites all these legends about George the Victorious is that he's famous exactly as a winner in a spiritual battle. The sacral role of a man that which we've talked about is indeed to be a knight, to be a warrior, and to be a defender of a woman. He's the one who doesn't let her forget that she's a woman in her true essence. He's the one who protects everyone, both weak ones and women, everyone, including men, protects them from Satan's influence. He's the one who's on the guard. And first of all, He's the one who serves a woman. After all, God created both a man and a woman as a single whole. She is the source of that power which gives him life eternal. A woman gives both primary life and eternal life. Well, if we draw, so to say, such a parallel between a woman and a man from the perspective of the invisible world, then for the system, a woman is like, well, let's say, such a juicy hamburger, while a man is like, soldier's boiled pearl barley. Well, let's take any person. What would he choose? Just imagine, you are very hungry. Will you be tempted with pearl barley or with a hamburger? It's clear that a hamburger is much more attractive. So, I'll repeat, the entire value of a man is, while being less noticeable and less interesting for the system, but possessing strength that a woman gives him to stand in the way of all demons. A man is like a warrior. That's why he's endowed with these martial qualities. He protects her, protects her from all, let's say, problems 
that may arise in this world. He protects her, well, like a mother protects her child, from all possible and impossible, visible and invisible hindrances on her way. And the role of a man is precisely to ensure that a woman wouldn't forget that she's a woman, while the role of a woman is to ensure that men wouldn't die. That's the point. Well, when the system interferes, men fight with each other and turn women into their slaves. And the only thing that remains for them is to shout, I obey you, Satan, and everything will be in its place. Isn't that so? The world is overturning. And just tell me, does such an overturned world deserve further existence? Just answer to yourselves honestly. And that's the truth. Yes. However, you know what gives a hope? That very Church the Victorious is famous not just as a winner in a spiritual battle, but he's famous as a conqueror of the apocalyptic beast. That's the point. Mm -hmm. A conqueror of the most terrible beast, which deprives not just a separate human, but entire humanity of life. That's what a man should precisely be. And the only ones whom he should fight with are demons, those evil spirits that lead humanity to death. After all, the enemies of that very George the Victorious were demons of all kinds, God-fighters and various evil spirits that acquired an earthly image. And he fought with them because all these are devil's servants. Right. There is also a very interesting piece of information. It was believed that the one who is under the patronage of George the Victorious, this legendary spiritual warrior, won't sustain any defeat. And those who understand the symbolism of the Grail Chalice, what kind of mysterious symbols and signs surrounded the Templars, and why this was also associated with the symbols and legends of the Victorious spiritual warrior, those do understand how significant this really is. Most significantly, what were they notable for, among others? They were absolutely free. For the Templars, precisely the image of George the Victorious was also very important because there is a legend that when they were in the East, George the Victorious himself appeared to them in a white cloak with a red cross. When they were losing a battle and he brought them victory and they adopted the white cloak and the red cross exactly from him. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is that a lot of people, a lot of men, depicted this very cross, precisely such a cross, on their seals, and it was used as a pendant. Yet, once you've said that this sign of exactly such a cross is much more ancient than those times… Well, of course, after all, it is believed that it's the Maltese cross in history, it is mentioned as the emblem of the Italian city of Amalfi. With Knights of Hospitallers, it is already mentioned in the 11th century, well, and later on with the Order of Malta. But in actual fact, this cross is much older. Even if we look at petroglyphs, a regular, equilateral cross symbolized a human being, while a cross with widening rays, which is actually the so-called Maltese cross, as they say nowadays, meant precisely. Well, if we speak a comprehensible language, it signified a knight of changes, meaning a person who serves only God. And in the times of changes, no matter which direction God sends him, he will act solely for expansion, that is, fulfilling the task set for him by the spiritual world. And everyone who put on or obtained such a cross, well, undertook 
let's say, they primarily had to understand that they serve only God and no one else, and that they should start their war with themselves. They must eliminate the power of Satan in themselves, and then do everything that depends on them in order to make this power weaken or vanish all over the world. This was a guarantee of the survival of humanity. Igor Mihalovich, we know that you also have a pendant that is associated with this ancient symbol. Forgive us for the request, we know that you are a modest person and always oppose such kind of demonstrations. However, could you show it right now as an exception, for the purpose of understanding what kind of symbols we are talking about? Igor Mihailovich, also, regarding the Templars, after all, the original for true knights, very important were the qualities of both knightly valor and courage, which you have just talked about. And the most important thing is that they really understood the true meaning of their existence. Well, how can it be otherwise? And it was important precisely to grow this love, of course. cultivation of love. Certainly. After all, again, they felt a great support, that which Maria's group was giving. They lived by this love. This is what raised them high into heavens. While they were those on whom this group relied, only with such a symbiosis, let's say, the society is capable of great miracles which were demonstrated by those very Templars. When in the decaying society, this living source was born, which has absolutely changed Satan's plans. Igor Mihailovich, we've now touched upon the importance of both women, of that which a woman bears, and it's interesting that this is mentioned in various religions after all. Much is said about a woman in that very Islam too. In Islam, a lot is said about a woman indeed. There are many hadith regarding the fact that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, that Allah ordered you to have good attitude to all women, because your mothers, your wives, your sisters, your friends are women. Moreover, the Messenger of Allah said that the more faithful a believer is, the more respectfully and lovingly he treats women. And there is also an interesting hadith that the Prophet, peace be upon him, said that the one who lifts up his hand against a woman Yes, his hand against a woman, I myself will personally complain about him on Judgment Day. I'll be testifying against him right. on Judgment Day. Still, we have now touched upon the subject of Judgment Day and the end times. We have voiced this. It's just interesting that it's mentioned in the Bible as well. There are such lines. In the Gospel of Luke, in chapter 12, verse 54, it is said, the lines regarding Jesus' words. He said to the crowd, when you see a cloud rising in the west, immediately you say, it's going to rain, and it does. And when the south wind blows, you say it's going to be hot, and it is. Hypocrites! You know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and the sky. How is it that you don't know how to interpret this present time? Why don't you judge for yourselves what is right? Igor Mihailovich, these are very important words, as it seems to me. Very important. And they apply to all hypocrites. Don't people really feel what is happening to them? Don't they see what is going on in our society? When we see clouds, we know it will rain. But when we look into ourselves, there is an abyss there. When we look at the society, there is no tomorrow. And don't we see that? We don't see because the demon closes our eyes. Isn't it so? And consciousness says, everything will be fine. Everyone lives this way. Take care of your daily bread and don't think of the rest. And people listen to it and take care.
We would also like to share information from Hinduism, in which it is said that there is a great hope that when people choose to follow the spiritual path, then this pure age will come, the golden millennium, where people will live in equality with each other as a single family, when they will be able to draw the most valuable, this very inner delight, precisely within themselves and… From the inexhaustible source. Right. It's also interesting, Igor Mihailovich, that it is mentioned that the Golden Age will continue until the spirit of brotherhood, the spirit of people's unity is strong. And if this spirit starts weakening, then at this point both distortion of the primordial knowledge and entry of the system will exactly take place. History repeats itself. People have already gone through this. It is so important for everyone to be in the spirit together, in the spirit of unity, as such a single whole spiritual monolith, in the spirit of love. Well, in order to be in it, it should first be created. Today, there is a Latra, and people already have these understandings. In this interaction between people, there indeed emerges something wonderful. Our tomorrow is emerging, which shows that people can achieve this. Of course, they can, if they want to. Right. And in order for us not to lose, let's say, our true predestination, we shouldn't forget who we are. Men shouldn't forget that they are men, and women shouldn't forget that they are women. However, in order for us not to forget this, we should recall it. Isn't that so? It is. And that's the point. And then there will be future. And then there will be everything. But for this, we need to remember who we are that we originate from the spiritual world. Absolutely right. And not to forget, not to forget about this. And not to forget about the Spirit, that first of all, we are not bodies, for bodies separate us, while the Spirit unites. Let's live by the Spirit, friends. Let's live together, and let's build such a society which every one of us would want to live in, and to live eternally such a society which we wouldn't be ashamed to leave to our children, a society where there is no slavery, where there are no lies, where there is no deception. After all, everything is within our power. If we unite, we'll be capable of everything, isn't that so? Where everything is honest, where everything is open, where there is no dirt and envy, where Spirit reigns, and where Spirit reigns, there is God's love. Let's live with love, with love within ourselves. Let's just love God and be faithful and devoted to Him.